This is my Bible. It is the Word of God and the will of God for my life. I am who the Word says I am. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. I'm where the Word says I am. I'm seated right now in the heavenly realms, in the place of authority, dominion, and power. I have what the Word says I have. All the blessings of Abraham are mine. And I can do what the Word says I can do. I can do all things through Christ who gives me the strength. The day my mind is alert, my spirit is receptive. As I am taught the Word of God, my life is changed for the better, and I will never be the same again. Amen. You may be seated. And if you would, turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians. And today we'll primarily be in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. I want to thank you for being here, not just on time, but early. I want to thank you for being mindful of inviting and bringing others. I want to thank you for helping and serving and being faithful to the Lord's house. The Bible says that when we're rooted and planted in God's house, we flourish and we prosper. At the beginning of the year, the Lord put it on my father's heart to do a series this year on Sunday mornings dealing with the truth about money and how we can walk in the blessing of the Lord. And that seemed theoretical at the beginning of the year, but now that we've walked through everything this year, we are thankful for it. And in the midst of everything that has gone on, we are blessed by God. And today's message is entitled, God's Plan to Fund His Work, His Mission, and His House. God's Plan to Fund His Work, His Mission, and His House. You know, we're blessed. I said we're blessed. In the midst of everything going on, we're blessed. And for the world, this year may be a year of the curse, but for us, as the people of God, it's a year of blessing, it's a year of favor, it's a year of increase. And yes, I just said in 2021, we're going to be even more blessed. My father said at 9 a.m. that today, because of time in the Word, we, we understand things and we walk in greater revelation than we did even just 10 years ago. Number one, faith and prosperity are about action. Tell your neighbor, say action. Tell your other neighbor, say action. Faith and prosperity are about action, taking action on the Word of God. And the key for many is just to get started. You can't start where your neighbor is at, can't start where pastor is at or where I'm at, but you can start. You can start taking the action you know you should take on the Word of God. You've heard us say that God's plan works, we just have to work His plan. And giving isn't the only way we can take action on the Word of God, but giving is one way. It is one way we can take action. Now you might wonder, why do so many believers not walk in the blessing of God? Why do so many believers not walk in His blessing and His provision? Well, the simple answer is they don't work His plan. Now these were some statistics from before the lockdowns and the shutdowns. And I'm sure that today, November 8, 2020, these statistics, if updated, would be even worse. But these are statistics from before the lockdowns, the shutdown. And here they are. Only 5% of Americans, and this is everybody, church, unchurched, saved, unsaved, lost people, this is everybody. Only 5% of Americans give 10% or more of their income. Now, I think we would all say, as the people of the Lord, should Christians do better than those that don't know the Lord? Yes. Should Christians be more generous than those that don't know the Lord? Yes. But the reality is, and this is before the shutdown, the lockdowns, American Christians on average give just 2.5%. So less generous than unsaved people. Now that should not be, but this explains everything. And there, there's a lie of the enemy, and a lot of times we buy into this, well, when I make more money or when this happens or when I get some super duper bonus, then I'll take the action I know I should take. Then I'll be generous. Then I'll tithe. Then I'll begin saving money. 
I know the last few weeks we dealt with saving money, and that is never a popular topic. But biblically, we should save money. Joseph saved an entire nation by leading them down the road of savings. And so we can buy into the lie, well, when this happens, when that happens, when, when I make twice the money, then I'll get started. But if you buy into that lie, you'll never get there. You've got to take action and get started right where you're at. And this next statistic bears this out of Christian families that make $75,000 or more, only 1% tie. See, it explains everything. And so if you were to say, well, Austin, why does it seem that there are some that walk in the blessing of the Lord, but there are others, and over, over time, it seems like there, there's no progress being made, and they're, they're not walking in the blessing of the Lord. It comes down to them taking action or not taking action on the Word of God. You've heard us say that tithes bring us into financial covenant with God, but offerings above and beyond the tithe, they mesh the accelerator. And the unsaved mind doesn't understand this. If I have $100 in my hand, and I believe on the Word of God that $10 of it belongs to the Lord, how, how can I live off the 90 and still be blessed, still have my needs be met, still have more than enough? Well, it comes down to the blessing of the Lord. We believe in Him, we believe His Word, and so we walk in His blessing. And tithes and offerings are God's plan to prosper His people. And in the midst of everything going on in the world, we're blessed by God. We are blessed by God. We, we are weeks away. We are weeks away from everything here, the property, the building, everything, being totally, completely, 100% paid off. We, we are weeks away. It is a, a mathematical certainty, amen? And we've, win, we've ended every month this year in the black, and not just a little in the black, but way in the black. Pastor said at 9 a.m. that this year has been the largest year in the history of the church, and there's no government money here, amen? You know, if you're like me and you're curious, if you log on to the Small Business Administration website and download the list, the list of all the PPP or Corona money, Faith Christian Center is not on the list, amen? God is our source. He is our supply. We're walking in His blessing. So God has a plan to prosper us, but we have to work His plan. First, let's look at 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 9. And Paul tells us that though Christ was rich, yet for our sakes, for your sakes, for our sakes, he became poor. He gave up all the glory, all the splendor of heaven to do what he did for us. He became poor so that we, through his poverty, we might become rich. And that word might there, it is key, it is fundamental, so that we might. It's not guaranteed because we have a part to play. And if you look a few verses up in verse 7, Paul says, but just as you excel in everything, say everything. Amen. We've, we've all got room for improvement, amen? And if you're a husband, you got room for improvement. You're a wife, you got room for improvement. If you're raising children, you got room for improvement, amen? At your work, whatever you do for a living, there is room. We all have plenty of room for improvement. And Paul said, just as you excel in everything, See that you also excel in the grace of giving. And he mentions faith, speech, love, other things, but he says, see that you also excel in the grace of giving. And so again, if someone came to me and they said, Austin, Austin, answer me. Why does it seem that there are some believers that walk in the blessing of God and there are other believers and they would say they, they love the Lord, but year after year after year goes by and no progress is being made. They may excel in an area over here. They may excel in this area, but there's an area in which they have not excelled. And what area is that? They have not excelled in the grace of giving. And it is a test of faith. So faith and prosperity are about action, taking action on the Word of God. So now go to 2 Corinthians 9, beginning in verse 1. Paul writes, there is no need for me to write to you about this service to the saints. For I know your eagerness to help, and I have been boasting about it to the Macedonians, and these were the eastern churches, telling them that since last year, you and Achaia were ready to give. And of your enthusiasm, it has stirred most of them to action. So he's writing to the church of Corinth. Then you read 1 Corinthians. This was a church that had many issues, fighting, bickering, 
divisions. You read about 1 Corinthians and you read the letter. They, they had many issues in the church. Services were out of control, out of order. The spiritual gifts were being abused. There was also great immorality in the church. There was a young man coming to church, carrying on a relationship with his stepmother, his father's wife, coming, sitting with her in service, openly, 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 openly disobedient and rebellious. So they had a lot of issues. But time had gone by, and now he's writing another letter. We call it 2 Corinthians. It's actually the third letter he wrote to the church at Corinth. And now in this third letter, he's commending them on some things. And one of them he's commending them on is their generosity. But your enthusiasm has stirred most of them to action. So giving is one way. Say one way. One way. Giving's one way we take action on the word. It's not the only way, but it is one way. And why are there believers and they never enter into the blessing of God? They don't take action in this one area of their life. They know the plan. They know what the word says, but they're, they're looking for a pastor who will tell them what they want to hear. Well, you don't have to do that, or it's not for today, or God has just not given you the gift of generosity. I remember being invited by some young men once to go to a young adult service in Dallas and sat through it. It was all great. But then I was horrified at the end because at this event, they had a bunch of food trucks. They were going to feed the young people. So, of course, there were a bunch of young people there. Amen. Free food. But anybody that owns a business, runs a business, knows you, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Amen. You, you got to cover it. And so I was horrified at the end of this service because the, the offering basically went like this. Well, if you have the gift of generosity, give something. But, but if you don't, God's just gifted you in other ways. And so when the offering was received, I, I looked around. You know, my father taught me to use my eyeballs. And it looked to me like nobody had the gift of generosity. <laughs> well, Austin, I, I just wonder why I'm not walking in the blessing of the Lord. You're not working his plan. Now, number two, the Apostle Paul planned and arranged offerings. Verse three, I'm sending the brothers in order that our boasting about you in this matter may not prove hollow, but that you may be ready as I said you would be. For if any Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we, not to say anything about you, would be ashamed at having been so confident. So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to visit you in advance and to finish the arrangements for the generous gift you had promised. So this proves that the Apostle Paul, he didn't do things haphazardly, but he planned and he arranged special offerings. He writes, then it will be given as a generous gift, not as one grudgingly or begrudgingly given. A generous gift, not one grudgingly given. Kenneth Hagin used to say that God loves a cheerful giver, not a tearful giver. Amen. You know, husbands, it's not a blessing to your wife if you get her something and then go on and on about how much it costs. <laughs> or because I got you this, this means X, Y, and Z. That, that's not a blessing. Cheerfully given, not begrudgingly given. We could say it this way, God loves a cheerful giver, not a fearful giver. And fear and unbelief and worry, it is all contrary to faith. Evangelist Tiff Shuttlesworth, who'll be with us in January, he called my father a few weeks ago and he said, I know exactly why you're paying the church off this year in 2020. My father said, tell me more. And he said that in this year, many of the churches that normally support Lost Lamb, their, their ministry, many of their partners, they have not only cut back their giving, they have stopped it entirely. But he said, Faith Christian Center has kept giving and has kept giving the same normal amounts, no cutback whatsoever. And he said, that's exactly why you're blessed and you're gonna pay off everything this year in 2020. So again, when the world's full of fear, that's the world. But we've gotta go with the word of God, amen? And his word is true at all times. You know, think about the time in which the Apostle Paul lived. Think about the context, the circumstances, the leadership, and everything going on. It was in that context, a time of great difficulty and persecution that he wrote, my God will supply how many of our needs? All of our needs according to his glorious riches in Christ. So that's true. 
at all times. Amen? That was true in Rome in the first century, and that is true for us today. His word is true. You've heard us tell the story of how years ago, Lester Summerall challenged my father for the church to receive two special offerings a year. And so we do those two challenge offerings. Then when we have a guest and do other things or we have an outreach, we receive special offerings to be a blessing. But whenever we have a special offering, that is always an opportunity at your level to ask God what to do and then to obey and take action. And new levels require new action. And at every new level, we should stretch our faith. Tell your neighbor, say, stretch your faith. Tell your other neighbor, say, stretch your faith. You know, when you were dating, a gift at this level might have cut it. But you're married. There are, there's however many kids, amen. All the pressures of married life and having a family and raising a family. So the, the, the gift that cut it at 18 years old is not going to cut it anymore. New levels require new action, amen? And as God blesses you in your home, your family, your marriage, and the kingdom of God, you've got to rise to the occasion and rise to new levels. And this is why Paul tells us, point number three, whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will reap generously. Verse six, remember this, whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will reap generously. So in your life, you're the farmer. You determine your harvest. You determine what kind of seed you sow. I shared last Sunday how Jessica and her raised garden beds, we, when she went out there one day, and there were these huge, ginormous watermelons. And she didn't even plant watermelons this year. They were from seeds last year. But why were there watermelons? Because she planted, at some point, watermelon seeds. So you, in your life, you're the farmer. You determine your harvest. You determine what kind of seeds you sow. You determine how much seed you sow. And you determine your harvest. And every seed, the Bible teaches us that every seed produces after its own kind. Now this is true in finances, but this is also true in every area of life. If you want a harvest of kindness, what must you sow? If you want a harvest of uh, people treating you nice, what must you sow? As Jesus said, the gold rule, doing unto others as you would have them do unto you. If you want a harvest of love and generosity, what must you sow? Love and generosity. So every seed produces after its own kind, and the harvest, it is always greater than the seed. And at some point, Jessica planted watermelon seeds, and if I remember correctly, a year or two ago, they didn't do that well. But time has gone on, and maybe these seeds made it down deeper over time with rain and whatever went on. And so the watermelons are huge, and every watermelon is full of more seeds. The harvest is always greater than the seed. Now this, as I said, applies to finances, but it also applies to every area of life. You know, sometimes young people will be unhappy. They'll say things like, I don't have any friends. Well, the Bible says if you want to have friends, you must show yourself friendly. So you're not going to have friends if you just stand in a corner, hang your head, don't talk to anybody, amen. And uh, just talking to people on Facebook or Instagram is not really real conversation, amen. You got to talk to people in person, get to know them in person. So in your life, you determine your harvest. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will reap generously. Now, my father laid out this outline for this message in 1997, a long time ago now. And he laid the outline out because the church then was at the same point it is now, and that is everything being paid off, no debt. And so in 1997, when everything was paid off and there was no longer any debt, that doesn't mean that we all sit down and don't take action anymore. No, we, we shifted gears and God began to use my father and the church to give more money to missions and outreach. And praise God, this is not an issue anymore, but back in 1997, 
when God put it on his heart to do more missions, more outreach for us to give the money to pay for the roof of Elam Church in Mombasa, Kenya, there was resistance. And the attitude was, well, pastor, I, I don't mind stretching. I don't mind taking action to pay off the building because we come to church every week. But, but I don't understand giving to something somewhere else where, where I don't even see it with my own eyes. So praise God, we've come a long way since 1997. Amen? But see, you sowed yesterday. There, there's going to be a harvest, but what happens if you stop sowing? At some point, the harvest stops, or it peters out. So praise God for yesterday's testimonies. Praise God for yesterday's miracles. Praise God for yesterday's harvest. But I, I want to live a life in harvest. I want to live a life in more than enough. I, I want to live a life where there's fruit month after month, and year after year. So if we sow sparingly, how do we reap? And we sow generously, how do we reap? Now number four, give what you decide in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Verse seven, each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a, a cheerful giver. What kind of giver? Cheerful, happy, joyful, good attitude. Glad to do it. Someone's saying, yes, Lord, willing and obedient. Our attitude ought to be like King David, who said in 1 Chronicles 29 and verse 14, who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you, and we have given you only what comes from your hand. So he, he was a happy giver, and he gave God all the credit and glory. Our attitude should be, Heavenly Father, with joy and gladness do I serve you, in my day of prosperity. So not reluctantly, not under compulsion, but cheerfully, happily, glad to do it. And so yeah, yes, we, we obey God because we, we love the Lord, we love Him. We love His kingdom, we love His house, we love His work, we love missions, we love it all. We love Him, that's why we obey. But we can also see with our eyeballs and we can use our common sense and see that there are promises and benefits promised in the Word of God if we do obey Him. We can see that. Number five, God wants you, say me. God wants you to have all that you need and God wants you to abound. He wants you to have all that you need and He wants you to abound. However old you are, whatever stage of life you're in, whatever the needs, whatever the circumstances, He wants you to have all that you need and He wants you to abound. Verse eight, and God is able to make all grace abound to you. See, you go back to the previous chapter, Paul called it the grace of giving. See, there's a lot of talk about grace. We're walking in grace when we walk in righteousness. We're walking in grace when we walk in holiness. We're walking in grace when we live a life of generosity. We're walking in grace when we're taking action on the word of God. He is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things, say, and in all things. Well, Austin, but what about this? And what about that? And all, how many things? All things. At how many times? In all things, at all times. Yeah, but in all things, at all times. But you don't know about this. In all things, at all times. You don't know about this circumstances. You don't know about this bill. I, I just got in the mail. And all things at how many times? All times. Having all that you need. See, you go back to Matthew 6, which has been our launching passage for this series. Our Heavenly Father knows what we need. He knows what we need. He knows what we need. And Jesus in Matthew 6 did not say that if we follow him, if we live for him, if we put first the kingdom and his righteousness, we would do without these things. No, he said, if we'll, verse 33, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all these things. What things? Food, clothes, provisions, things that people in the world spend all their time trying to get. If we'll put the kingdom of God first, all these things will be added unto us. And then Paul says here in 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 8, in all things, at all times, having all that you need. In all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound. Say, say this, say, my heavenly Father, he wants me to abound. 
Now in what? In every good work. What is a good work? A good work is a tangible action that can be, it can be seen in every good work. Go back to the illustration of saving money. With all the technology today, we have no excuse. And so depending on where you work, if you have access to an IRA plan, a 401k plan or 403b plan, whatever it is, you, you can arrange it at work to where they, they deduct that money, it is gone, it is in savings before you ever see it. And that works pretty good for some of us because I know me. I get my hands on it, I'm gonna do something with it, amen? Or you might have to just do it yourself depending on the situation, but praise God, all this technology, it can also be used for good. And so you can set it to automatically move 1% or 2% or 5% or 10%. And you might hear us talk about 10% or 15% or 20% and say, Austin, I just can't do it. I'm not there yet. Well, the key is to take action right where you're at and to get started. And if you don't take action and get started, how will you ever get to a better place? The definition of insanity is to keep doing the same thing again and again and again, expecting a different result. And so maybe you can't do 10%, maybe you can't do 15%, but everybody can do 1%. I don't know. Do we serve the Almighty God or do we not? So no matter whatever it is, whatever you make, whatever you cross your hands, I, I promise you, if you will set aside that 1%, God will make it up to you. I promise you. Because his word is true. And the, these are principles that result in blessing. And I promise you, if you'll take action on his word and tithe and give offerings as led by the Holy Spirit, not only will he replace it, he will multiply it. But you got to take action. In all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will, I know, do without, be in lack, be in need. Uh, Austin, I, I'm serving the Lord. Going backward. See, that, that is a poor witness of the living God. In all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, he has scattered abroad his gifts to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. So what is God's will for your life? It is having all that you need, you abounding. What are we to abound in? Our good works, our good actions. What, what is God's will for your life? Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you might have life and that you might have it how? More abundantly. 3 John 2, the Apostle John wrote, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. So tell your neighbor, say, God wants you to abound. Tell your other neighbor, say, God wants you to abound. And not just in spirituals, not just in right belief, but in good works and good actions. Because the reality is what he does, he does through us. What he does, he does through people. And that's why we're to be blessed so we can be a blessing. See, we're coming up on the Christmas season. In a few weeks, we'll share ways in which you can be a blessing to families in need and children in need. But see, if you're not blessed, if you don't have enough, if you don't have enough to buy your son or daughter the Christmas gift they desire, how can you then give a Christmas gift to a child of a family that you don't even know? And so the lie of the enemy is that he doesn't want us blessed so we have no influence we have no impact, and we have no ability. But that is not God's plan. Now, number six, there, there's a lie out there that if you walk in the blessing of the Lord, you'll backslide. And that is a lie. That is another deception of the enemy. You simply cannot backslide prospering God's way. Number six, you cannot backslide prospering biblically, prospering God's way. When you do it God's way. Look at verse 10. Now he who supplies seed to the sower, to the sower, and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. So as I work God's plan, and as I walk in his blessing, and as I take greater action on the word of God, and as I rise to new levels, and at new levels, I don't punk out on God, but I keep putting God in his house first, keep taking action, and then I take action at that new level, I'm also being enlarged in my harvest of righteousness. See, it is a righteous thing to walk in the blessing of the Lord. It is a righteous thing 
to take action on the Word of God. It is a righteous thing to pull ahead and to succeed and to prosper so you can be a blessing not only to the kingdom of God and to your family, but to others and those in need. It is a righteous thing. And that's why there's the lie out there that if someone walks in the blessing of God, that somehow that's not righteous, that, that is not spiritual, and they're not as spiritual as someone that has no fruit, no evidence in their life. And that is a lie of the enemy. It is a righteous thing to work God's plan. It is a righteous thing to walk in the blessing of the Lord. It is a righteous thing. And when you prosper God's way, when you prosper the Bible way, you won't backslide. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 21, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. We, we've said in this series that money and how we handle money, it reveals our heart and our priorities. And you might say, I'll also explain this more. When people decide to drift away, it always shows up first in their money. When a husband's heart drifts from his wife, it shows up first in how he handles money. You look at somebody's tax return, it reveals a lot. You look at somebody's statements, it reveals a lot. How we handle money reveals our heart and our priorities. And so what do we see happen pastorally? A young man or young woman, they, they decide they're not gonna wait on God to meet their need anymore. They decide they're gonna marry an unbeliever. They, they decide that even though the Bible says to be equally yoked together, that even though the Bible says what does light have with darkness, they're not going to wait on God to meet that need anymore. They're going to date an unbeliever. And because, of course, an unbeliever doesn't believe in getting married and doing things God's way, what are they going to do? They're going to move in together. But see, all of that first shows up in the money. Before they head down the road of disobedience, they first stop giving. Remember a few years ago, there was a young man and had a bad attitude and the bad attitude got worse and worse and worse and worse. And he worked full time. But do you think he tithed? See, where our treasure is, is where our heart is. And we see it again and again and again. A man or woman will stop giving before they disobey. While they're thinking about sinning, but before they make the choice to sin, it'll first show up in their giving. Someone will stop giving before they stop coming to church. So if you do things God's way and you're putting your treasure where in the kingdom of God, where's your heart gonna be? And see, because your treasure's in the kingdom of God and your heart's in the kingdom of God, you are going to make decisions accordingly. Oh, I can't do that. I can't do it that way. I can't do business that way. I, I can't have lunch with him or her because my, I got so much invested in the kingdom of God. And when you got much invested in the kingdom of God, where's your heart? But see, when someone's heart is just a string of spaghetti and it's going this way one week and this way the next week, is their heart really in God's kingdom? Now, you look at it, some statements that would show up. Number seven, you'll be made rich in how many ways? Every way, so you can be generous. How often? On every occasion. And our generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. You will be made rich in every way, so you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, our, your generosity, our generosity, will result in thanksgiving to God. Well, whatever we give, God will replace and multiply Whatever we obey him with, standing on his word, he will replace and he will multiply. You cannot go backwards working God's plan. Number eight, sowing and reaping is God's plan to fund his work, his mission, his house, without it costing us, his children, anything. See, we, we've seen it wrong, that, that if I work his plan, I'm gonna do without this, I'm gonna do without that, and then I, I gotta stretch what's left over to make it. That, that's saying it all wrong. That is not his plan. His plan and us working his plan with our finances is to fund his kingdom, his mission, his work, his house without us, it costing us anything. Verse 12, this service you perform is not only supplying the needs of God's people, but is overflowing in many expression of thanks to God. 
because of the service, we could say duty, because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, men will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ. So it's tied together with obedience. They'll praise God for your obedience that accompanies your confession and for your generosity and sharing with them and everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. So in these days, we've got to renew our minds to God's word. We've got to change our perspective, our attitude, what we're saying. We, we got to be cheerful and happy. Men, verse 13, men will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession and for your generosity. Men, women, people we don't even know around the world, on the missions field, wherever it is, at an outreach somewhere, they will praise God for our obedience and for our generosity. Over time, what leads to blessing and prosperity? Over time, what leads to us in all things, at all times, having all that we need and abounding in every good work? What leads to that? Our obedience and our generosity. Over time, what takes us to new levels? Our obedience and our generosity. Over time, what results in more than enough? Our obedience and our generosity. Over time, what takes us to that blessed place? Our obedience and our generosity. Sowing and reaping is God's plan to fund the kingdom of God, and his plan is to do it without it costing us anything without us going backwards. If I have $100 and I bring $10 of that to the house of God, if God cannot replace that, if God cannot increase that, then he is not God and his word is not true. It is as simple as that. He is the almighty God. And when that boy put the loaves and the fishes in Jesus' hand, he increased it, he multiplied it, and everybody ate and was satisfied. And as the Apostle Paul said, that day men, women, children, they praise God for the obedience that accompanied that little boy's confession of faith. Now in just 30 seconds, I want to rehearse this. And this is important because we get in our minds that obeying God is going to cost us something. It may temporarily, but God will make it up to you. Anything you do for the kingdom of God, God will replace and God will multiply 30, 60, and 104 return. And not just with money, time, volunteering, helping. You know, I don't know how many stories in the history of the church there have been of, of women and families and young couples that were desiring to conceive children and they began helping in the children's areas or in the youth group. And then God blessed them. See, sowing leads to what? A harvest. Now, as we, we come to the end of paying off the building, when my father challenged us all in 2018, that Easter Sunday. If that day you had asked me, and if you had told me, say, Austin, in this challenge, this is what you and Jessica are, are gonna do and what God is gonna enable you to do over the next two and a half years, I would not have believed it. He, he has enabled us to so far do more than we could have thought or imagined. And even once the building is paid off, our, our commitment won't be done, so we'll, we'll still keep taking action. But even though we have stretched, even though we have taken greater action, my testimony is this, we have not done without. It has not cost us anything. Before that Easter Sunday, Julia, our fourth, had been born. Praise the Lord, amen. And since that Easter Sunday, our, our fifth has been born, amen. Every need is met, every bill is paid, there is always plenty left over, amen? And any parent that takes trash bags and trash bags of diapers to the garbage bin understands what I'm talking about, amen? We, we've not gone backwards, we, we've not done without, we walk in greater blessing today than when pastor challenged us in Easter of 2018. And so I, I stand here and I testify that, that God his plan, it is designed to not cost us anything. And whatever we do for the kingdom of God, he'll make it up to us. Whatever we give to the kingdom of God, he'll make it up to us. You, you say, Austin, I, I don't have enough time. Give some time to the kingdom of God. Serve, volunteer, help out. You'll reap a harvest of time. Every seed 
produces after its own kind. And if we sow sparingly, how do we reap? But if we sow generously, how do we reap? And our faith, it is a faith of giving. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever should believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. For God so loved that he gave. And as we walk with him, we become more like him, and we love, and so we give. We love, and so we give to God's kingdom, God's house. We love, and so we give to our husband or our wife, our children, our family. We love, and so we give to those in need. We give to those that are doing without. We love, and so we give.